from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Planting a crop just got a whole lot more expensive. Last year they were paying probably about $350 a ton for urea. This year it's close to $1,000 or in some instances over $1,000 per ton. How rice farmers are farming among higher input costs. Planting in the middle of a war zone. The mayor of one Ukrainian city speaks out as farmers fight to save their fields. Drought has its grip on the western part of the country, but in other areas, it's exactly the opposite. You know, we're looking at the prospect for some planting delays. We get the latest on soil moisture as farmers prepare to plant right now on Ag Day. Good morning, I'm Tyne Morgan. Clinton Griffiths is on vacation. Well, drought is continuing to persist across much of the west as we head into planting. The latest drought monitor putting just over 57% of the country in moderate to exceptional drought. That's a slight improvement from last week. But drought conditions are up 12% from the same time last year. Meteorologist Matt Urasovic will take a closer look at how things have progressed with the drought monitor over the past several weeks coming up. But in other parts of the country, it's the opposite. It's simply too wet to plant. You can see on this map where topsoil is short to very short with the areas in red most concerned. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey tells me one of the key wet pockets right now is in the eastern Corn Belt. All five states east of the Mississippi River are reporting topsoil moisture at least one quarter surplus. And some of that wetness is extending south into some of the Mississippi Delta states. You know, we're looking at the prospect for some planting delays across the southern and eastern Corn Belt. It's all consistent with that La Nina driven storm track that takes the storms out through the central Great Plains and then into the Midwest. So we are looking at places like southern Illinois, Indiana, Ohio and southern Michigan likely to experience ongoing wetness on top of the wetness that already exists. We have seen flooding already in parts of the Ohio Valley, the Wabash River in Indiana has, has had quite a bit of flooding this spring. Now, Rippey tells me conditions are somewhat better as you move north and west, and it's less likely the upper Midwest stays saturated as the planting season inches closer. Ag Day Weather, brought to you by AGI Nico. AGI Nico dryers have an average of one to two pounds heavier test weight per bushel than screen dryers. They can also save you 30% on average in fuel savings. That's money in your pocket. Visit aggrowth.com slash Nico for more information. Well, meanwhile, dry weather is continuing to fuel dangerous conditions in the West. Matt Yurasovic joins us with more. Yeah, Tyne, that's right. There's been more dry weather back there in the West. And We've got to take a look at the newest drought monitor that came out just yesterday afternoon. And if we take a look at that, starting four weeks ago, you'll notice again back in the West, we've had a lot of areas that have really stayed dry in extreme to exceptional drought conditions. Now, as we move forward, you're going to notice the West stays very dry. There's a little couple changes there in the East, but most of the uh, dry weather has been back in the West, even with a little precipitation. The current drought monitor still showing dry conditions in the mid-Atlantic and the southeast, and then from southern Louisiana through Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and back to the west, still very dry. Today we also have fire conditions there elevated in the area highlighted in orange from Dallas all the way up through central Nebraska, and elevated risks there north of Wichita and in parts of Oklahoma. Over the next 10 days, lots of precipitation going to be on the way, most of it from Texas and Oklahoma on to the east, but also Pacific Northwest and Northern Rockies could be looking at some good doses of mountain snow and some heavier showers in the lower, lower valleys. And this video shows now just how tough farmers in the Ukraine really are. Susie Kinzenbaugh is the president of Kinsey, and she's been sharing videos on Twitter of farmers using their equipment continuing to plant in the war-ravaged country, including this farmer. Great to see, and hopefully they stay safe. I'll have more on your forecast coming up. 
USDA is signaling there are now 95 commercial flocks confirmed with a deadly avian influenza strain. The agency's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service continuing to keep this updated list containing both commercial and backyard flocks where the virus has been confirmed. In total, there are 147 entries on its website, the latest a backyard flock and shared in Wyoming. The most recent commercial flocks listed are in Minnesota impacting both turkeys and poultry involving more than 353,000 birds. Well, two big votes this week regarding Russia following its invasion of Ukraine. First, the U.N. General Assembly voted to oust Russia from the Human Rights Council. Second, Congress voted to suspend normal trade relations with Russia and ban imports of its oil. And for farmers in parts of Ukraine, the situation seems to grow more dangerous by the day. The mayor of the city, Melitopol, in the southeastern part of the country, speaking out about what farmers are facing. A very dangerous situation with uh, agriculture and uh, farms because uh, uh, Russian soldiers uh, try to find all agricultural equipment and uh, take it off to Crimea also. That's why it's a very dangerous situation because uh, Ukraine gave... Uh, because uh, uh, we can't uh, make uh, anything in uh, our land. And uh, of course, at uh, summer and autumn, we can't uh, take any uh, anything from the land. And uh, uh, now Ukraine uh, gave 30% uh, of agricultural production, of some agricultural production of all over the world. And uh, it's a hard situation, not only for Ukraine, but uh, all over the world. Yes, it's a terrible situation. The mayor says there is no food in the city and there is no pharmacy right now. He says Russian soldiers are kidnapping businessmen and civilians, stealing their money and their clothes. And the invasion of Ukraine could have ripple effects on food supplies around the world, especially Africa and the Middle East. And there's word the Biden administration is preparing to tap an emergency fund to help people in those regions. A U.S. Agency for International Development officials spoke with lawmakers this week. It's estimated hunger and poverty could exceed the global food price crisis of 2007 to 2008. The World Food Program says up to 47 million people could face acute hunger if the war is prolonged, with sub-Saharan Africa the most affected area. In total, the organization says 325 million people could become acutely food insecure this year. And it's reported another food struggle is on the way, this time for people in Shanghai. They are reportedly struggling to get meat, rice, and other food supplies. Right now, the city is under anti-coronavirus controls that confine most of its 25 million people to their homes. People in China's business capital have grown frustrated over the government's effort to contain the spreading outbreak. Complaining online, grocers are often sold out. Well, later today, we'll get new supply and demand numbers from USDA. But ahead of the report, soybeans are continuing to rise. A look at what's fueling that market coming up. And we know the winner of the NCAA tournament, but who won the AgWeb Bracket Buster Challenge? I'm shocked it wasn't me, but you will meet the real winner coming up on Ag Day. Food producer ConAgra says higher than expected cost pressures will continue for the rest of the year. It comes after the company issued a weaker than expected forecast for the fiscal year ending in May. ConAgra says its results are being hit by higher transportation and raw materials costs. It says inflation is outpacing the price hikes that they put into place earlier, adding the cost of goods increased more than 10 percent during the quarter. The Chicago-based company said it expects full-year gross inflation to be approximately 16 percent, compared with its previous guidance of 14 percent. The maker of Bird's Eye, Slim Jim and Ready Whip has said another round of price increases will be needed. Well, Brian Split of AgMarket.net joining us now. Brian, on Thursday, we got another look at weekly export sales. Is that what fueled the soybean market on Thursday? Tyne, I think so. Um, the, the sales were not really better than expected in the sense of the trade estimates uh, pre-report. So, you know, you get estimates of a uh, low end estimate and upper end estimate. It was kind of in the middle of that, but uh, with old crop and new crop combined, it was yet another week of over a million tons of soybeans that were sold. And uh, as we get into this stage of the marketing year, this is typically when we should start to see the, the amount of soybeans 
of old crops sold start to, to wind down. Um, but yet we had the drought in Brazil, so we're still seeing uh, purchases of U.S. soybeans, and, and we're definitely ahead of the pace that we need to be running at to hit the USDA target. So I, I think a lot of this is some pre-report buying, thinking that once the USDA releases those balance sheets, that they will show an increase in soybeans for export, thereby reducing the old crop uh, uh, balance sheet here. Well, speaking of that report that will come out later today, if we are ahead of the export pace right now, is the trade watching to see how much of an adjustment USDA will make? Yeah, absolutely. They have to be um, because w when you think about what we're going to be focusing on over the next two to three months, uh, and fast forward a month down the road, we're going to get our first new crop balance sheet. And um, after the quarterly stock and the planning intention report, we had a, a very bearish soybean report because of the acres came in larger than expected. Um, and the market really shrugged that off and not to say it shrugged it off because we were sharply lower that day, but we made a low the next day. And, and here we've been going back up since. And so I think the trade is saying, okay, we've probably seen the worst case scenario for the acreage estimate for new crop beans. Uh, but now we need to go back to focusing on the old crop because whatever the old crop uh, carryout is reduced by is going to come right off the top of that new crop estimate next month. So um, we got to figure out what we're going to see from the USDA. Uh, the, the pace of exports does suggest that we're going to reduce our old crop carryout even further. Uh, we're going to have a tight scenario going into our new crop, and that's just going to put that much more um, importance on, on the, uh, the crop that we're growing this year. All right, thanks, Brian. Let's take a quick break, and then we will have a check on weather next. To contact Brian Split at Ag Market, call 844-4-AG-MARKET or visit their website at www.agmarket.net. Find farm equipment on Machina Repeat's April 19th online auction. No reserve, no buyer fees. Start bidding now at auctions.machinerepeat.com. again by meteorologist Matt Yurisavik. Matt, the South has been dealing with a week of wild weather, but this period of active weather is not over. Yeah, time. that's right. It's going to be another very active week next week, even heading into the weekend, still staying active in parts of the country, especially in the east as we head through Friday, still with some rain and snow showers there in parts of the country that have uh, been seeing those colder shots of air. Meanwhile, back in the west through Friday, staying very, very warm. It does uh, get on out of here, though. That chillier air kind of swings on through. More mild conditions come back, but... We see as we head into early next week, another system coming out of the Rockies. And with big shifts in temperature here, we could be looking at an, a chance for severe weather across the central part of the country as we head through the middle part of next week. That system gets on out, but again, staying very active in the west and more rain for the east as well. So here's a look at that severe weather threat looking possible from Monday to Wednesday next week. A large area here all the way from the Midwest all the way down into parts of Texas and the Gulf Coast where severe storms are going to be possible. Possible. Again, this is looking ahead towards next week. There could be a tornado threat with this, damaging wind threat, and even some hail possible. And this would be Monday to Wednesday of next week. So here's a look at our map right now. Storm system getting off the coast and another one kind of swinging right on through the Great Lakes with high pressure in the west. So lots of sunshine out west, lots of cloud cover and showers in the east through Friday. Heading into Saturday, high pressure moving towards the center of the country. Still some light snow showers there for parts of the Great Lakes and some rain moving through interior portions of New England. Another cold front coming into the west, though, bringing a reinforcing shot of some chillier air and some higher elevation snow in the northern Rockies. So here's a look at those temperatures. And uh, yeah, it is going to be very chilly across the east, especially as we head towards tomorrow morning. We're going to be looking at lows all the way down into the lower 50s into parts of Atlanta and down where the Masters is, Augusta, Georgia. It's going to be a chilly morning to start off. Meanwhile, 30s in the upper Midwest. And then we've got to talk about the chillier temperatures hanging around in parts of the Great Lakes. But notice, still pretty warm. Southern Georgia down through Florida. 80s popping up on the map again in Amarillo, down toward Dallas and San Antonio. And it could be closing in on triple digits back in Phoenix. So staying very warm out ahead of that next system. That's a look around the country. Now let's take a look at the weather where you live. 
Caribou, Maine, wintery mix turning to rain, a high of 40 degrees. Moving to Paragon, Indiana, rain and snow showers, a high of 44. And Farmington, New Mexico, lots of sun and staying mild, a high of 68. Well, input costs are rising, especially for rice farmers. Up next, we check in on how Plant 2020 is coming along in Louisiana. Find farm equipment on Machinery Pete's April 19th online auction. No reserve, no buyer fees. Start bidding now at auctions.machinerypeat.com. Well, farmers across southwest Louisiana are entering the final stages of rice planting. While rice farmers in the northeast corner are just beginning. And this year's rice crop is proving to be a very expensive one. As LSU Ag Center correspondent Craig Gotro reports from southwest Louisiana. With temperatures rising and fields drying, rice farmers in southwest Louisiana are putting the final touches on planting this year's crop. The prices for fuel, fertilizer, and seed have gone up dramatically. To help lower their costs, some farmers are doing more water seeding than previous years. With some of the high cost of seed, uh, they can use the conventional varieties so they can up their seeding rates. And water seeding has typically been used to help control weeds, especially red rice. While fertilizer requirements are not as high as some crops, such as corn, farmers do need to apply it to have a successful crop. And it comes with a sticker shock. Last year they were paying probably about $350 a ton for urea. This year it's close to $1,000 or in some instances over $1,000 per ton. Prices for farm commodities have risen, but rice prices have not seen dramatic increases like other crops. The price of, of rice really hadn't seen the boost that we have in some of the other commodities. So it's going to be a real tough season because we really don't have the potential for a lot higher yields. Levy says rice acres could approach 440,000 acres in Louisiana if North Louisiana has any significant acreage. But he doesn't expect that number to be quite that high. North Louisiana has options to plant corn or soybeans, so some of those acres may shift to one of those crops. Farmers in North Louisiana are just beginning to plant their rice crop, which makes up about 20% of the state's rice acreage. With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Gocher reporting. Thanks, Craig. Well, rice farmers in South Louisiana hope to have their first crop harvested by August 15th, which will allow them the opportunity to grow a second crop from the stubble. Coming up, how did you do with your NCAA bracket this year? Well, I talk with the winner of our Bracket Buster Challenge for some insight on how to make a winning one. That's next. Find farm equipment on Machinery Pete's April 19th online auction. No reserve, no buyer fees. Start bidding now at auctions.machinerypeat.com. NCAA tournament is over and Kansas has been crowned the winner. But we have some winners as well from our Ag Web Bracket Busters Challenge. We want to say congratulations to all the winners of the first Bracket Busters Challenge presented by Case IH. More than 1,200 farmers and ag industry professionals from across the U.S. took part this year. Clinton Chip and I did fill out brackets and look at how well we did are not so well. Chip finishing ahead of Clinton and I coming in 322nd. I'm very proud of my 615th place and Clinton, well good thing he's on vacation. We'll have to break it to him that he's finished 976th place. Knowing him, he probably had Oklahoma State winning the whole thing. All right, so here are the actual real winners this year. Third place went to Deborah Ellis of Pleasanton, Kansas. She got $250. Bill Wagner of North Dakota came in second, getting $500. And the first place winner, and the winner of $1,000, went to Marion Dovenberg of Minneapolis, Minnesota. I got to talk to Marion about how she managed to make all those great picks. Absolutely total luck. I mean, I fill out the bracket just because it's fun. I think two things gave me a little bit of an edge. One was that I picked Murray State, which was not a high ranking team. And that was totally because by coincidence, I heard some sports announcer mention they liked Murray State. And when I saw it on the bracket, it was like, oh, I'll take this guy. And, um, and then I had North Carolina, you know, and they ended up in the final game. 
which I had. I had them in the final game. And, you know, hardly anyone put an eighth seed in the final game because, you know, the reality is that wasn't the smartest move in the world, <laughs> but it turned out to be great. <laughs> so I think between Murray State and North Carolina, it made up for all my other mistakes. So I'm, I can live with that. I have several nephews and brothers that I need to keep the bragging rights going, you know, in perpetuity. It'll go forever. So I've set the bar now and uh, we'll see if they can jump high enough, but I doubt it. <laughs> and, and it's all in good fun. That's what it's about. So it was. Congratulations to Marion and all the winners in our Bracket Busters Challenge presented by Case IH. Well, that's all the time we have this morning. Thank you for watching. For all of us at Ag Day, I'm Time Morgan. Have a great weekend in farm country.